everyone. Welcome to the Currency of Anarchy. I'm Josh Davis. Michael Freeman. Uh, if you'd like to be a part of the discussion during our live taping, check us out at youtube.com slash user slash Cur of Anarchy on Mondays at 9 p.m., 6 p.m. Pacific. You can see the final product on the air at youtube.com slash user slash voluntary virtues on Wednesdays at 3 p.m. Eastern, noon Pacific. And please check out our Facebook page at facebook.com slash Cur of Anarchy. If you're here during our live taping right now, you can post any questions and comments to the new thread we've made, or send us a Facebook message, and we'll certainly get to it. Holly Cogburn runs Homebody, a body care, vanity, and cosmetic products company. She contracts using USD, Bitcoin, and barter. She is proud to say that she started the business without the assistance of bank loans. In her words, fuck bank loans and fuck their interest rates. For the most part, fuck banks. She has paid her startup costs out of pocket and has steadily and sustainably grown from there. She believes in a free, fair, and reputation-based market, relying on word of mouth. So please, find Holly at homebodyco.com or facebook.com slash homebodyco. All right, sounds good. So, um, yeah, Michael, uh, we have Christopher Cantwell tonight. Yes, we do. We are joined by anarchist, atheist, asshole, Christopher Cantwell. You might know him from Free Talk Live. You might know him from A Voice for Men, LewRockwell.com, ChristopherCantwell.com, or my personal favorite, Some Garbage Podcast. Chris, how are you doing tonight, bud? And good to be with you guys. I'm no longer I'm no longer with A Voice for Men, actually. I just, oh, I didn't know okay. just I just wrote an article smashing them. I should probably remove that from my About page, but uh, I, I am a former contributor to A Voice for Men. <laughs> Uh, all right, I, I want to ask about that, but we want I, I'd like to roll along first. Um, I gotcha. We usually like to start with, uh, you know, just asking how you, briefly, how, how you came to find personal liberty. Um, I was arrested in 2009 for, uh, for driving while intoxicated in New York. I was one point over the legal limit. I was not... Drunk, I actually passed the uh, the field sobriety test. You know, the walk and turn and follow the pen and whatnot. But they have a machine that you know reads your breath alcohol limit, and they say that you know the machine said I was guilty of a felony, basically. Uh, and because it was my second one within ten years, and the first one was when I was actually sleeping in my car. I had taken a nap the first time nine years and two days prior, and so the second one within ten years in New York is a felony. I was facing four and a half years in prison. And so I began to study for my defense in that case, and I was looking into, like, the Constitution of the United States. I found a video series by uh, 2004 Libertarian presidential candidate Michael Badnarik uh, titled Introduction to the Constitution. And that, uh, I would say, like, sometime during the course of that video, like, my life changed. I was radicalized. Yeah, that was, like, a, I think, I believe I watched that, too. That was, like, an eight-hour series. It was, yeah. It was a long yeah. thing, and I think, like, like I felt it happen, like, somewhere, like, you know, probably, you know, three and a half, four hours into the thing, halfway through the uh, series, I was like, you know, I don't live in the world I thought I lived in. It was something that really, it really rattled me, and I haven't been the same since. Right. I had a similar kind of transition, you know. I'm a, unfortunately, I'm a veteran, so I was all cognitive dissonance about the, the U.S. Constitution, and, and it was really hard for me to let that go, but... I eventually did, you know. Yeah. So I uh, actually didn't like you when I when my friend John showed me your works. Um, I was still more of a I don't know liber big L libertarian type at the time, uh, and he showed me the video, the Cult of Dusty, or why the Cult of Dusty is an idiot. That statist. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, and yeah, I found you to be like more of an entertainer than a philosopher, and like I, I dig that, you know. So uh, I yeah, got I mean, stuff. you're you're in good company not liking me at first, right? <laughs> I'm, <laughs> I'm sort of an abrasive guy, and everybody who doesn't like my ideas can go fuck themselves, right? <laughs> so if you're not into what, if if my ideas are not your ideas at the time, then I can be a major turnoff to a lot of people, and I'm yeah. not I'm not entirely surprised by that. But uh, I do, I do frequently get that. That like, oh, dude, I fucking hated you at first, but you know, and then, then they warmed up to me later on. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm glad to see you on this side of the fence now. Yeah, man. Well, I'm not sure that you're the quite the asshole that you you try to be. But anyways, <laughs> so 
you, I'm not sure if this is your philosophy, but this, this mm -hmm. ism was given to you by Jeffrey Tucker, and I think it has something to do with architecture, but uh, libertarian brutalism. Could you give us a, some kind of synopsis? So I think I, I do believe the term libertarian brutalism was coined by Jeffrey Tucker, and it and it is it's an architecture reference. So brutalism was a style of architecture that actually became popular with socialist governments, and and the idea being that it would basically show the function of the building that it it, it did not much care for aesthetics that it was there to show uh, form uh, function over form. And to to really just dis it was meant as a show of strength, really, right? And so the the reference is an astute one in reality. I didn't really like the way Jeffrey put it, but it's an astute reference to. It's not my philosophy at all. I mean, this has been around for quite some period of time. That basically the only thing that's really off limits in this world is the initiation of uh, force or fraud against person or property. I, I understand it to mean hardline non-aggression principle. Yeah, it's hardline non-aggressionist, you know, and and the thing is that we have in in what many would describe as the liberty movement, a lot of people who attempt to incorporate a lot of different things into it. That people feel differently about different issues and try to insert their personal preferences into what is a uh, a fight for, in my book, the the concept of non-aggression as the standard of conduct. And so I am hostile towards people who try to distract from that effort. When people try to say that this is about uh, race issues or gender issues or that sort of thing, uh, social justice warriors, that sort of thing, uh, I, I treat them with hostility. And uh, this, uh, you know, obviously gets a fair amount of hostility directed at me because it's a pretty popular thing to like you know not be down with misogyny and to uh, to oppose racism and stuff like that but I don't really care if somebody's a racist that's not my problem that's a thought in their head and there is a significant effort in uh, government and legislatures and and the judiciary to oppress people because they have ideas that are unpopular and so I feel like it's a res almost a responsibility of a libertarian to stand up for a person's right to be a racist and of course it's terribly unpopular but uh, I, I do believe that that's the most consistent position that a person can take and so I take it. Yeah, um, I'd start with well the only thing I owe you is non-aggression. I, I, right. I, I don't owe you politeness or political correctness um, and I'm, I may not choose to associate with with somebody who is who is a blatant racist right I mean if somebody if you know if somebody's gonna get up in the morning and be like I'm just going to hate me some niggers all day long like that's not it's not a guy who I'm gonna be friends with right like sure. he's like you know if he's like, hey, don't uh, don't put those brown eggs in the fridge with my white eggs. I mean, you know, <laughs> if people are just ridiculous, then I don't want to hang out with them either. That's just stupid. Sure. But at the same time, like on the, let's just take it to the other end of the spectrum. If somebody's like, well, let's go to the movies, but first let's call our black friend and our Asian friend and our Hispanic friend and make sure that we have an equal number of women because we wouldn't want to be a fucking blah blah blah. I'm like, go fuck yourself, asshole. I don't need everything to be a matching demographic with your social justice warrior crap. Leave me the fuck alone. Yeah, um, right on. Well, well, I'm sorry, I lost my <laughs> thought there. Um, um, you know, I only care if somebody's racist. Like, think, think whatever you want to. That's that's great. I only care if somebody's racist to the point where it affects me or the people that I care about, or the general. You know, I don't. I'm not sure that I care about the. The it's the moment they act on it that's the problem, right? Sure. It's like well, the moment that they act on the things that they're thinking. Well, if they go <laughs> yell in public and and chant, I'm not so concerned about that. But if they shoot guns at people and burn crosses and on people's private property and hang these, people, yeah, then are, I have a These are very clearly initiations of force against person and property, right? So, like, I already oppose that, and I don't really care. You know, I don't care if you you know, burnt a cross on somebody's lawn because you're a racist or if you set their mailbox on fire because you didn't like them, right? Sure. It's the same problem. If somebody if somebody has like a business and they want to have like a, I don't know, let's say you like live in a black neighborhood and there's a minority of whites and you want to have a whites-only bar and you want to put a whites-only sign on your bar. 
Well, like, look, I mean, I could imagine, like, better business models and shit like that, but hey, I mean, if it serves a certain market and people would rather just be surrounded by their own kinds, like, I don't think that that's, like, the worst thing in the world. There was a there was an issue where, like, a bunch of students wanted to start a, a white student union, and it damn near started riots at the college, and this guy from, like, American Renaissance came out, and, you know, he considers himself a race realist and just says that, you know, people should be free to live separately and that most people, if left to their own devices, would choose to live separately. And, and he makes a lot of valid points that, like, you know, you look at these these white liberals, these white middle income liberals, they don't move into black neighborhoods. You know, they, they talk all this shit about they want to live in more diverse societies, but they certainly aren't moving into them. They're moving into, you know, upper class white neighborhoods when they have the ability to do so. So it would tend to suggest that people don't choose to be in more diverse societies, that diversity is not what people choose. And I mean, I think there's a lot of legitimate arguments for it. I don't personally think too much about the race of the people that I'm around, you know, except if I'm the only white guy in the room and then I'm very much aware of it. And so I can get like how, you know, minorities feel in society. But it's just a thing that when, when people try to make it an issue, especially when they try to directly associate it with libertarian causes, I would say that that's just completely incorrect. It's a diversion of our attention and resources, uh, and it has a tendency of starting more problems than it solves. Sure. Yeah. I, I, Josh, what do you got? I, th I think it's right. Um, let me um, take my personal life into consideration here. Um, I um, am with a black girlfriend here. Um, my engagement. And, right. And so I went down to um, visit her family in New York City uh, this weekend. And, you know, obviously I was aware uh, that, that I was the only white person there, but uh, we all got along. We all uh, understand each other. We all know that we're uh, just there to have fun, and you know that's it. That that's all that matters. You know, just don't initiate aggression. Don't start none. There won't be none. Right, and the other thing is that when you're the only white guy in the room, you do have a very unique advantage that a lot of us don't recognize. If the police do come, all you do is drop to your knees and say, "Thank God you guys are here," and everything oh. is fine for you. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's true. You know, I. Uh... I don't know. I've lived in the ghetto. I've been in the military. Like, I'm I'm a white Irish kid, brought up Catholic and whatnot. But I I, uh, I have no problem mi mixing, if you will. Like, I, I think it boils down to free trade. And I smoke weed and you know trade in in alternative um, currencies, if you will. And you know everybody around the areas that I am do that. I my I just moved in here. I'm like my neighbors next door who are not all white, we already kind of have our, our network going and Right, and, and I, I would say that, you know, free market economics is a very strong incentive for, you know, for those kinds of associations and for people to have good relations with their neighbors and with people abroad. And, I mean, we know that from, you know, foreign policy stuff, too, that when you have free trade between nations, that those nations, you know, tend to, to be, you know, peaceful with each other. And when you have sanctions and stuff like that, that, that people tend to have, you know, uh, then there tend to be other conflicts. And so, uh, yeah, I, I would definitely agree that... Uh, the greatest incent incentive that we have for uh, you know good relations with people is is free trade, and then uh, you know we, we don't need all of the other bullshit if we have a free market economy. Can you define the other bullshit? The um, the I would especially the legislative efforts when they say that it's like uh, you know it's illegal to discriminate against somebody, right? So. Uh, you know, there is the the situation where uh, a baker of a family bakery was forced to bake a cake for a gay wedding. That they said that the government would come in and shut them down or fine them or whatever uh, because they because of their religious beliefs uh, did not want to bake a cake for a gay wedding. And they said, well, you can't discriminate against them, even though you're a private company. You can't discriminate them, and the government will force you to. I think that that's an extraordinarily offensive thing. I think that anybody who cares about freedom should really be upset about that. And look, I'm an atheist. I have no sympathy for these fucking religious people either, but I don't uh, I can't uh, advocate the initiation of force against them, and I can't feel good about people uh, who feel good about it. Sure. <laughs> I mean, I consider a, a private business to be the same thing as a private home. Like, if I own a company it's and it's my property, it's the same thing as my house. If some Nobody's going to come into my house and tell me who I can sell stuff to and threaten me with murder. I mean, that's crazy. 
Right, and I mean that's exactly what's happening. So I mean those, you know, the people who wanted that wedding cake. I mean, you know, certainly there's a dozen other bakeries in the area that they could have gone and gotten their wedding cake from, but they felt so fucking entitled that they were just going to force this this uh, this small family-owned business to make their uh, wedding cake rather than walk down the street and get another guy to make it. In my book, they are the bad people. I don't think that they are deserving of any sympathy when they go to the state and try to get them to force people to do things for them. And, uh, you know, people people who would side with them over uh, the, the family business, that, uh, that I find extraordinarily offensive. And that's what I'm referring to by the other bullshit. Right. Yeah, yeah. Right. Um, I was thinking... Um when, you know, like the legislature tells you that you can't discriminate against a person, the problem is you, you can make decisions against any other product in the market, but you can't make a decision about uh, who you're doing business with. That, that's, you know, an economic, whoa, hold, hold up, that's a problem, you know what I mean? Well, the thing is that the truth of the matter is is that the government would really like to regulate your every economic activity. It just really lacks the resources to do so. So you're talking about like you have a choice between other products in the market. The government would far prefer that you did not, right? The government would far prefer to completely centrally manage the economy because the idea behind central economic planning is that all of this competition is screwing everything up, that if we all just work together in one central economic plan that we would all have more resources. But it simply fails to take into account the fact that people do have different... Uh, values and and different desires and stuff like that, and that's why central economic planning fails. and And they they are aware of that on some level, but whenever they have enough popularity behind a cause that they think it can gain them a little more power over the economy, they will take it. And race is one of the things, uh, gender is one of the things, and sexuality are are you know these are things that the state knows are popular causes they can take up, and they pretend that they're spreading freedom by doing it, but what they're doing is grabbing power. I'd say right. religion as well. Um, oh yeah, certainly religion. Well, fucking everything, really. <laughs> so you were on Comedy Central recently. Christopher, the enforcer can't well. Yeah, so the Colbert Report came out here to Keene, New Hampshire, and uh, did a uh, an episode about the parking enforcement. Uh, what's the word that we should use for this? It's not cop blocking. They're not cops, but we Robin go out and we, we Robin Hood. Yeah, Robin Hooding. I should have that word right off the tip of my tongue. Robin Hooding, basically the, the act of putting coins and meters before the meter maid can write a ticket. And so there has been uh, a team of people doing this in New Hampshire for quite some time, particularly in Keene, where uh, some gentlemen actually started paying people hourly to go out and do it in an attempt to actually completely shut down the parking enforcement here in Keene, New Hampshire. And it ended up costing the city upwards of eighty thousand uh, dollars. Our our <laughs> efforts to do that, eighty thousand dollars in lost uh, enforcement revenue. And of course, when this happened, then there was a lawsuit, and it hit the local newspapers, and then it hit national media. And we had a few documentary crews out here. And at one point, the the Colbert Report came out here, and you know, the Colbert Report is like, uh, look, they're a lefty outfit, right? I mean, it's Comedy Central, so they took it out of context and, you know, attempted to make us look really silly. But we sort of always expected them to do that, and we were happy just for the coverage because it's seen by a lot of people. I right? mean, I, I'm not, I'm not going to go as far as to say that Stephen Colbert understands the, the first principle of libertarianism or anarchism. However, he's a great sat satrical comedian. I, I think sure he's is. a funny guy. And, and yeah. The, the piece, the hit piece that he did on you guys was so freaking hilarious, man. Yeah, a lot of people <laughs> said like it was like bad press, and I just don't believe in that concept, really. I mean, the more the more people say negative things about me, the more people go to my website, the more people donate money, the more people sign up for my email list and Facebook page and Twitter, da 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 da. So I am I have made a career out of bad press, <laughs> quite literally, and so I don't I don't believe in the concept. But of course, a lot of people did uh, freak out about it because they felt that it made us look silly. But I'm like, hey, you know, if you think you're going to go on the Colbert Report and not look silly then I don't know what you know about media. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. It was funny. They they did. They made you guys look like assholes, but that was... I mean, that's what I expected. Yeah, I think they actually called funny. us shit stains. Uh, and, <laughs> and they actually did call us douchebags, assholes, and shit stains, all three. So You call um, yourself an asshole, man. Yeah, exactly. I'm like, <laughs> go ahead. It's on the fucking headline, dipshit. I don't care. <laughs> Speaking of assholes and, and garbage, uh, what's up with your podcast, Chris? Some garbage podcast. 
So some garbage podcast. When I was still in New York, I was trying to do it on a weekly basis with my with my host at the time, Eddie Dunn. Since I have moved to New Hampshire, it has been somewhat less frequent because I don't I don't have somebody that I feel comfortable doing a, a regular show with absolutely yet, right? So I've tried to sort of uh, shuffle co-hosts in and out and and figure out a time that works well. So I thought garbage... I thought Adam was great actually. Adam. A demo, yeah. Oh, a demo, yeah. A demo is great. I, I, I like a demo. I enjoy his company. Um, he's a very busy guy, working a lot. But he, you will see him on some garbage podcast again in the future. But we, uh, it, it has been going on somewhat infrequently as I do it when it's convenient and the mood strikes and I have a co-host. But I'm going to start trying to do it again more regularly. I, I, I want to produce at least a weekly podcast. Uh, I can announce. Uh, I will be announcing it here for the first time on your show that January second. Uh, I don't know the time slot. It'll probably be either five to seven or ten to midnight uh, that we will be doing the uh, the first uh, episode of Some Garbage Podcast on January second, and uh, it'll be a two-hour show. Me and Jason Rapture are going to do it. Not exactly sure what we'll talk about, but the uh, title right now is something like uh, "It's Day Two and Fuck 2015 Already." <laughs> <laughs> that's fantastic. Yeah, I, that's um my favorite of your mediums is is Some Garbage Podcast. Uh, but I guess I've always, I've always been surprised by that. I mean, I get that comment from time to time, and there, there's there's certainly not the most watched or or downloaded mediums that I produce, but there are a lot of people who who took to that show, and and I literally named some garbage podcast because I felt that it was shit, right? Like I like I am I am often not a fan of the content that I'm producing. I always feel like I could do it better, but I want to get the content out. And some garbage podcast, you know, really uh, really started off as exactly that, where like if you listen to the first episode, like the first episode that's online, like we're not even <laughs> speaking sucks. into microphones. Oh, it's terrible. You guys yeah, are- and in the second episode, like we had so mics, we had audio problems. problems. You know all these different things, and and it was just like a joke that I was like, well, what do you expect? It's just some garbage podcast. And uh, you know, over time, we sort of worked out some of the bugs, got some interesting people in there, and I'm looking forward to bringing it back again. I actually like the bugs. It goes with the the you know your your click, the garbage podcast thing. When I first started watching with you and Eddie Dunn, it was you two drunk bastards like sitting in the living room. He's usually drinking bottles of wine, and you're drinking cases of beer, and it was some. Hilarious. So speaking of Eddie Dunn, um, from your show, I, I kind of got this this idea that, and, and Josh agrees that we want to kind of get somebody who disagrees with us at least once a month. And uh, next month, yeah, like an incom, we want yeah, an incom. Next, next month we have Jeff Justice, who is an anarcho-communist. Um, the following month we have. Lauren Rumpler, who's an objectivist, and I'm more of like a nihilist myself, so that that should be very interesting. And I'm gonna, more objective. Yeah. Eh. <laughs> so yeah, I was gonna. I was thinking about maybe trying to get Eddie for uh, for the next month, the the minarchist, the constitutionalist. Right. Yeah, I think uh, Eddie Eddie's a really entertaining guy, and he's a lot of fun to talk to. I think it'll be a blast. Yeah, you guys bounced off each other good. So I mean, this must just lead us into free talk live, huh? Um, so since some garbage podcast sitting in your basement drinking beers, now you're in a syndicated fucking radio station. Yeah, so on Wednesdays from 7 to 10 p.m. Eastern, I am uh, the co-host of Free Talk Live. It airs on over 160 broadcast stations across the United States and as well as on uh, satellite radio and, and many numerous uh, pirate radio stations that we cannot possibly account for, as well as <laughs> LRN.FM, and it's syndicated online in several other platforms. Uh, so we uh, we have we have a pretty decent-sized audience with Free Talk Live. I'm really excited to be doing Free Talk Live Especially because I feel like working with Mark and Ian helps soften me up, if you will. Like I can be in a really abrasive guy, and Ian is sort of like uh, the uh, the guy who's trying to be all the way calm and mellow, and Mark is sort of in between. So I feel that that environment, uh, you know, sort of helps bring out the best in all three of us. And I, I think I think the the shows that we do on Wednesdays are fantastic, and I really enjoy them. <laughs> yeah, I do too. Um, it's hilarious to see you, your conversion. Like the first episode I saw you do with them, you were you were this mother flying ants. <laughs> uh, you know, watching you learn how to censor yourself has been funny. I, I again, I, I usually only watch on like 
or listen or watch on on Wednesdays and Mondays for you and uh, Derek J. Yeah, it is. It is difficult, you know, trying to do the FCC radio thing because I, you know, I am not one of these guys who's like cursing in videos and stuff for the sake of doing it. Like I curse every day in my regular life. I mean, yeah. I I say fuck very frequently in my everyday life, and sometimes it like creates awkward situations. Like I don't realize that I'm in places where I'm not supposed to curse, and like people will look around and be like, "He just said fuck like three times in one sentence." <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I can I can really relate. You know, on on a much smaller scale. Like I've been doing this show for this is probably like my tenth or eighth or something. Um, when I first started, every other word was motherfucker, and now I'm I'm toning I'm I'm learning to tone it down. Like I brought this up last week, but unfortunately last week I was on the bus and I like. I was getting off the bus. I was like, "Hey, peace, faggot!" to the bus driver. <laughs> like, she got, she was so pissed at me. And <laughs> I was like, "Oh, I didn't mean it. I was just trying to be nice." You know. Yeah, um, it's it's interesting if, when you start becoming aware of it and trying to deal with it. You know, I've only really started trying to deal with it in the course of Free Talk Live because most of my associations, it's just become you know accepted. And but being on Free Talk Live, I do have to be aware of it and have to control it. And so I find myself catching myself in ordinary everyday life and sort of using profanity less frequently because I've learned to be aware of it, if you will. Did you use less profanity in your "All I Want for Christmas is a Fucking Revolution" video? <laughs> no, I certainly didn't. But I was very aware. I was very aware of every like profane thing. Like I actually did like edit out a couple of fucks. Uh, <laughs> there was a lot of fucks in that video, but I actually did <laughs> edit out a couple because you know the 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 all I want for Christmas is a fucking revolution video is something I've been doing since 2011, and it's supposed yeah. to be like a curse you out, get angry, yell at the camera type of thing. It's a rant video. Um, but I did notice that I said, like, fuck twice in a sentence, and I'm like, well, just put the fuck in front of the word that I really want to accentuate, you know? And, like, I'm, it's weird for me because I never really thought about it that way. I'm just like, fuck, fuckity, fuck, 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 and, and I just think that that's perfectly normal. But I've been, uh, I, I do think it's a result of being on FTL that I'm just more aware of it, and it's causing me to say, like, oh, well, what's the value of using this particular word in this particular sentence? I'm more careful with my language. Right, well, I don't know. I, I uh... I think you bring a, be a a good dynamic. I've been listening to to Free Talk Live for a while, and <laughs> um, I don't know. It's a funny show. I let you know, Mark's. Uh, ain't, uh, he, I don't know. I, I I've only met him once at Pork Fest, but I th I think that he's angry as all hell, and he he, he just kind of holds it all in, and the way yeah, that, I mean... the way that him and Ian bounce off each other is. Is really funny. Yeah. Somebody I actually don't think made, that they some, know that it's as funny as it is. <laughs> yeah, somebody made a chart. Somebody was actually making fun of the show and not in a positive light, but they made like a, you know, like what is the percentage of time that Mark is just trying to disguise his total hatred for the internet? <laughs> and it was like 25 to 40 percent of the show was just Mark trying to pretend that he didn't hate Ian. And I assure you that these guys get along in real life. That's not what's yeah, going yeah. on, but like. There is there are times during the show where you're just like there's you could you could smell the tension in the air, um, and there have been incidents where like Ian's cut Mark's mic and my, Mark has like cursed him out and run if out jo of the If Josh studio. ever if Josh ever cuts my mic, um, I'm I'm kind of done right then and there. I mean, <laughs> I'm not gonna cut your mic, man. <laughs> <laughs> um. <laughs> so so. You've been putting out a lot of videos, well, not videos, but 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 articles about, and I, I listen to you on Free Talk Live a lot. I I hear you talk about conspiracy theories a lot. Um, not a lot. I mean, I don't think that what I'm lately, talking about is lately. usually. I mean, I I put out uh, there was a video that I, it was an excerpt from Free Talk Live that I put it out there, and uh, you know, it it, ins it begins a Facebook discussion. And so, yeah, I, I think that conspiracy theories are good for libertarian, libertarianism overall, whereas there are a lot of people who would disagree with me. A lot of people would say that conspiracy theories tend to make us look bad, that they tend to drive people away, that they are a huge distraction and waste of time. I take the uh, position that regardless of whether any particular conspiracy theory is true or false or wrong or whatever, 
that the the perceived downsides of turning people off and making us look crazy are small in comparison to the number of enthusiastic and very deeply concerned people who do come into uh, these circles as a result of conspiracy theories. Yeah, um, I mean, I end up saying this every episode of this this damn show, but I was in the military, and I didn't like what I saw at, at the end, and I got out, and then I kind of jumped on the Alex Jones train, and then I kind of jumped on the Ted Cruz, Rand Paul train, and then Ron Paul, and you know, you know how it goes. Yeah. And now I believe in nothing, <laughs> so... Um, I was I was a conspiracy theorist, and you know, 9/11 was one of the big ones for me. That that motherfucker kind of kind of sent me to war, and, and but at the same time, like like, I don't think that I need to explain that stuff to people. Like, there are so many more obvious things that I don't I don't even need to explain. I can just kind of point or or, or point people in the right direction to, without having to to prove such. Right, they'll come to it themselves. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so... As far as 9-11 goes, I'm pretty sure that foul play was there. I'm not sure exactly what, but I don't believe the commission report by any means, and it seems more likely to me that there was foul play of of some form, but I'm not a scientist, I'm not an architect, I'm not in any position to say anything about falling buildings or any of that stuff, you know? Yeah, I would say that um, in, in my own personal life, like I spent a great deal of time on it when I first started getting You're involved in these. Yeah. Yeah, so in New York, you can imagine that in New York, like the 9-11 truth movement is kind of bigger than it is in other places probably because we had to watch the towers come down and people, uh, you know, a lot of people were very much affected by that. They have family members who were first responders, all these people who, who, who died of, you know, lung disease and, and different things. So there's a lot of people who are very interested in the 9-11 truth movement and who, of course, get involved in all sorts of other ideas once they find that. Because you watch something like, you know, say, Loose Change, and next thing you know, you're looking into Alex Jones, and then you're looking at the Bilderberg Group, and you're looking, you know, you're going down this rabbit hole that, you know, there's not really a limit to how deep you can go down this rabbit hole. And so... uh, the, the contention with some people is that, like, well, you're going to bring in crazies, you're going to make us look crazy, yada, yada, yada. But I'm like, you know, I can't imagine that it's a bad thing. If I'm trying to undermine the legitimacy of the institution known as the state, I can't imagine if it's, it's a bad thing that we tell people that it predicates wars based on lies where it murders its own citizens and blames them on other people, right? I don't know if that's exactly what happened, but I think it's a pretty good safe bet that like whatever preceded the war was some sort of lie. Well, I, I would like to see um, conspiracy theorism <laughs> as like a stepping stone. Right. Um, l- let me make like three examples. Myself, um, you know, I'm not the most successful person, but now I go to festivals. I'm a political activist constantly. I participate in black, free, gray markets, co-host the show, write, do all kinds of stuff like that. My best friend John, who is in the same boat now, is a nearly freaking professional Bitcoin poker player, right? Nice. Chris Cantwell right here. I mean, we don't need to say enough about that. So, yeah, I think it brings... It has the potential to bring people to the movement much more than constitutionalism does, or yeah, I mean, well, you know, you get you get a lot of constitutionalism in the in the um, in the uh, if you will the the conspiracy circles, but you know, I would say because you know, and I don't know if it's as prevalent in other places. You know, where I live in New Hampshire, uh, this matters more, right? Because when we when you move to the Free State Project or you move to New Hampshire to be amongst other liberty minded people. Uh, you know, you're now dealing in social circles that were previously a, much more just resembling everybody else's Facebook relationships, right? Where you're actually seeing <laughs> your Facebook friends and stuff, and you all have these political ideas. And I think for most people, they, they talk about their political ideas on the Internet, and then the people who they argue with, they never have to see them. In this place, you do have to see them. And so 
it's one of these things that there are people who are slightly more concerned about their associations because it's one thing if you you know have an argument with somebody about 9/11 in a Facebook group, it's another thing if you do it like at a bar in front of a bunch of people. So people get very concerned about that. But I would say that the the fact that you have so many people who are interested in the conspiracy theories that you need to be concerned about it is the evidence that it is bringing people in, and therefore you're refuting your own argument by saying that it does not. Sure. Well, yeah. I mean, if 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 there's a topic of discussion, then people are uh, on either side are going to uh, to come towards it. I think, you know. And yeah, New Hampshire. I I can't even imagine. Uh, and I've been considering coming up there for quite a while. I'm o I'm only in Rhode Island. I'm I'm three hours away, so it's not the nice place be that to live, man. It's a nice place to live. You know, you get plugged into, you know, a new circle of people and, you know, hopefully make some friends there and, you know, not pay taxes and carry a gun and do whatever you want, you know, that, you know, within reason. Now, are you sticking around? Yeah, I'm not going anywhere. Yeah. <laughs> well, we have a, a big one to come into after. Uh, I think we're going to go over the currency here in a sec. Yeah, um, we're going to go over this uh, this recent MK Lords article and... With yeah. with with it's a hit piece against basically Steph and Kokesh and Cantwell and uh, Cantwell wrote a a, a a rebuttal article can't tell the difference between welfare and donations which is I mean if you're a libertarian or an anarchist or a, a voluntarist and you don't know the difference between hey give me that and hey can I please have that you're gonna have a bad time <laughs> so um, Josh. All right, sounds good. Last time I took these prices was uh, December 22nd. Tonight is December 29th. Um, so I took these prices at 8.29 tonight. Um, last show, silver was at 15.69. Tonight it's 8.15.86. Uh, That's a change of 17 cents, 1.1%. Uh, Gold went from 11.7802 to 1185.75, that went up $7.73, that's a 0.7% change. And Bitcoin went down from 331.15 to 313.38, that's a 17.77 drop, a uh, drop of 5.4%. So um, yeah, some big change for Bitcoin. Actually, um, over the last day, um, Silver and gold shot up, um, gold up about 20 bucks, and silver up about 20 cents, and then they dropped right down to the same exact price uh, today. So, and it, it was literally like verticals. They they weren't gradual changes or any hills or anything like that. They were they were shots down straight. So um, <clears throat> anyway, but again, I think. You and I both know, Chris, that uh, silver and gold, at least, is manipulated. Bitcoin has been going down steadily uh, over the past year. I don't know if you're following these changes, I guess. But personally, I've seen a lot of, um, like, sudden changes or uh, drops or, you know, surges. Um, and, um, you know, and that's the same thing with the oil price. I mean, that was a gradual glide down over the summer through the end of the fall. Um, and, well, no, actually, that was uh, from the spring through the summer or something like that. Anyway, um, they gradually fell down, and I think they're going to be gradually going back up. But, um, again, these are all speculations, and um, it's not well, a big deal. In yeah, so to, if you would like me to chime in on the different sure. prices of everything that you just listed, it could take a little <laughs> while, but I mean, you know, oil yeah. oil we've seen coming down. I think that you had to expect oil to come down at some point because, I mean, it did have this really dramatic shift upwards and everybody's sort of been like, okay, well, I guess, you know, 350 a gallon is the new normal, but, I, you know, today I filled up for under $2.50 a gallon and that it felt good, you know. I felt, you know, wealthier when I left the gas station than I did... I mean, it was uh, 350 a gallon, and I'm more apt to buy the product. I think you, you see uh, with you know oil and gasoline, that's a thing that's 
the government is basically artificially increasing the price of it through taxes, regulations, preventing people from drilling, pe preventing people from uh, you know exploring for an oil, and, uh, oil on their own private property. Uh, so, but governments can only prevent a thing from making it to market for so long. If it can't make it to market through uh, normal avenues, it'll make its way to market through black market avenues, and so. And government keeps up the price of oil and and gasoline by keeping uh, us from having enough access to it. But eventually, markets figure it out and they get us what we need. Sometimes it just takes longer than others. Uh, Bitcoin. I do watch Bitcoin pretty much every day. I do have a you know not a substantial sum of Bitcoin, but a few hundred dollars worth of Bitcoin that I'm hoping goes over a thousand dollars at some point, so that I can say, hey, I just made a shit ton of money. Um, <laughs> But, you know, Bitcoin is difficult to chart the reason for drops. Uh, I'm certain that there's a certain amount of manip manipulation going on in Bitcoin. I'm, I've said before that, you know, one of my, my primary concerns with it is just the amount of Bitcoins in circulation. It would seem to me that, like, the Federal Reserve could just buy all the Bitcoins. Um, yeah. But, you know, if the Federal Reserve bought all the Bitcoins, that would just make a bunch of libertarians fabulously wealthy, and I can think of, you know, worse outcomes than that, right? Um <laughs> Right, but then they wouldn't be libertarian anymore. Uh, you know, look, if the, if the Federal Reserve wants to pay me 2000 bucks a Bitcoin, I will sell some Bitcoin to the Federal Reserve. I will do that. <laughs> Speaking of uh, Bitcoin, and this is a video that I'd like to include in the, uh, in the video, uh, once it's edited and all done. Cam, well, you made a, a video called How to Tell People About Bitcoin. Where you do it in this this sleazy fucking car salesman voice, and it's uh, it's funny and hilarious, and you don't even swear. I don't even think you swear once, to be honest. I did not, because the thing was, I worked out the pitch at like the Cheshire County Fair here. It was really just right after I moved to back to New Hampshire, and so I went out with uh, Ian Freeman from Free Talk Live and some other activists, and uh, I just. You know that you get to knowing the questions that they are going to ask, and so I worked in them all into this like, "Hey, have you heard about this? Let me tell you about it," and and went through this whole, you know, sort of introductory pitch thing that I think that more than people even understood what I was saying. They were just interested in the way that I was presenting it, and then wanted to talk to me more. And I and I ended up you know talking to them and answering all the questions again that I had just answered, but you know. I, I, it was a fun pitch that uh, entertained a lot of people at the fair, anyway. So just recently, I did some outreach at the Cheshire County Fair just outside of Keene, New Hampshire, at a booth set up by Free Talk Live's Ian Freeman. Ian had provided various literature and propaganda on a range of subjects, but the one I had the most success with was Bitcoin. I had worked out this pretty elaborate pitch that a lot of folks found informative and entertaining, and I figured I'd share it with all of you. Unfortunately, we did not record my pitching to the fairgoers because I didn't, I, don't, I didn't like want to scare any of them away with the cameras, but in any case, here goes the pitch. Hey, folks, have you ever spent money before? Sir, have you ever spent money before? Ma'am, have you ever spent money before? Oh, wow, what a coincidence. I spend money, too. My name's Chris. We have so much in common. Let's have a little chat. We're over here talking about a new kind of money. It's called Bitcoin. Have you ever heard of it? Bitcoin is amazing. Some people say it's the most important thing to happen to money since gold and silver, which is kind of a radical statement because as you may be aware, gold and silver, they have kind of been around for a little while, right? Like thousands of years. Bitcoin has only been around since 2009, and when it first started trading, you could get a whole bunch of Bitcoins for one single US dollar. Today, Bitcoin is trading at over 610 US dollars for one Bitcoin, which would tend to indicate the demand for this currency has gone up quite a bit in just the last five years, wouldn't you say? Have you ever bought anything on the internet? When you do, you're probably using credit cards or PayPal or something like that, right? In any case, when you do that, you're still spending US dollars just like you probably do everywhere else. You're familiar with US dollars, right? Green pieces of paper, got a bunch of funny symbols on them. They say Federal Reserve note. You always wish you had more of them. They always seem to be going out faster than they're coming in. Yeah, you know dollars. You're familiar with them. When you're trading in dollars, you may, over the course of time, notice that the price of goods and services tends to go up over time. Are you familiar with the phenomenon that causes this? Economists call it inflation. When you look at your dollar and you see it says Federal Reserve note, that's because it's issued by the Federal Reserve, which is like a, it's like a bank. It's like a corporation. Some people think the government controls the bank. Some people think the bank controls the government. But, you know, that's kind of beyond the scope of what we're here to discuss. In any case, governments like to wage wars and build prisons and do all these kind of lunatic things that are really, really seriously expensive. Normally, they get the money for doing this by taxing you, but when they raise your taxes, you tend to get kind of ticked off, and that doesn't help them win elections, and so they would rather inflate the money supply. 
So the Federal Reserve prints money and creates digital dollars to fund the government. By printing money, they increase the amount of money in circulation without any respect for the amount of goods and services on the market. If the amount of goods and services on the market does not increase at the same or greater rate than the money supply, then more dollars competing for the same amount of goods and services. Simple supply and demand dictates that prices go up. And unfortunately, it always seems that your wages are the last things to go up as prices increase, which tends to make your life kind of difficult now, doesn't it? That's one of the reasons I'm so excited about Bitcoin. There will only be 21 million Bitcoins in circulation and there will never be any more than that for all of eternity. It is impossible to create more Bitcoins. And the way we know that is Bitcoin is an open source system. Are you familiar with open source software? Open source means we can see the original programming language. Like, if you buy Microsoft Windows, it's illegal to copy it, and you can't see what's going on behind the scenes, and it's buggy, and it crashes, and it gets hacked, and after 10 years, Microsoft is like, screw you, go buy the new one. That's what we call closed source software. Linux, on the other hand, is open source, and people often use it for servers because it's more reliable and secure. Open source means we can see what's going on behind the scenes, exactly how the system works, and if there's a problem, people who are a lot smarter than me, they go out and they fix it. Bitcoin is open source, so we can all see exactly what it's doing. It's also peer-to-peer. -peer. Have you ever done any, like, file sharing on the Internet, um, music, movies, torrents, Kaza, anything like that? Bitcoin is the same concept except with money. The peer-to-peer -peer system means we're all equals. It's not controlled by any bank, corporation, or government. The system is supported and controlled by the people who use it, and there are hundreds of thousands of us. Nobody has any special privileges. Even if you have a lot more Bitcoin than me, even if you are super rich, all you can do with the Bitcoin system is buy and sell your own Bitcoins. You can never touch mine. Nobody has any special privileges. Now, that's a world of difference from the banking system you're used to, right? With U.S. dollars, there's kind of like a lot of special privileges. I mean, for for one, if I print dollars, I go to prison for counterfeiting. But if the Federal Reserve prints dollars, the government is like, hey, good job, guys. Keep that up. The other thing is, like, if you put some dollars in a bank account, you have some sort of a legal problem, right? For good reasons or bad, whether you break a law, you get a fine, you get sued, you have a tax problem, you get divorced, whatever it is, the government goes to the bank and says, freeze his account, seize his assets, I want to tax his money, I want to regulate his money, I want to control his life by controlling his money. And I just think that's terrible. I don't want people to take my money. I don't want people to control my life. And that's what's so great about Bitcoin. There are no special privileges to the Bitcoin system. Nobody can create more Bitcoins, and the only way anybody can get your your bitcoins is to get your password and you look like a pretty smart guy so i don't think you're gonna like make your password abc123 or leave it laying around for anybody to find right because that would be like giving your money away and i mean who wants to do that right it totally changes the game even when you use like credit cards and stuff you're giving someone an account number and giving them permission to take money out of that account and that's why identity theft is such a huge problem with bitcoin it's the exact opposite the vendor gives you his account number and you put Bitcoin into his account. Nobody can take Bitcoin, but anybody can put Bitcoin into someone else's account. And how often are we upset that someone gives us money, right? Seems to make a lot more sense that way, if you ask me. And that's why it's gaining acceptance so rapidly. I mean, more and more people and businesses are accepting Bitcoin as payment. People have bought houses and cars with Bitcoin. I just bought some silver bars with Bitcoin from SonsofLibertyMint.com. It's being accepted for payment at Dell Computers, Newegg.com, Overstock.com, and so many other retailers. You can even go to this service called Gift. GYFT, and they will sell you gift cards for all your favorite stores like Target, Home Depot, Sears, Amazon, Victoria's Secret, Kohl's, Best Buy, and many more. They, they actually give you like a 3% rewards program, so it's like getting paid for shopping at your favorite stores. In any case, I'm really excited about Bitcoin, and those are just a few of the reasons why. If you've got a smartphone on you, I'll be happy to set up a free Bitcoin wallet for you right now. It's just a free app you install right from the App Store. It won't cost you a thing. I'm not here to sell you anything but an idea at this point. If you would rather not do that or you don't have a smartphone, then when you get home, I'd like you to take a look at this website on the back of the pamphlet I gave you, weusecoins.com. They speak a lot slower than me, and they can tell you all about how to set up a wallet, where you can spend bitcoins how to acquire bitcoins and this whole entire economy that has popped up around bitcoin if you have any questions i'll be happy to answer them but if not my name's chris and thank you so much for your time uh so i guess your your big story right now is this mk lords who i guess is a female that's about that's about all i got um yeah i wouldn't say it's the big story i mean it's it's the most recent one um sure, sure. You know, and it's it's certainly the big story for her right now. She hasn't. I don't <laughs> think she's ever gotten this much attention before. But uh, yeah, I mean, it's going on. <laughs> so, from what I gather, th this person wrote an article um, against donations, li libertarians, 
anarchist donations, uh, you know, for, for content creators, while she's also posting a Bitcoin address on her own website, um, against Stefan Molyneux, Adam Kokesh, and yourself, and she called you guys welfare queens. And, yeah, uh, she called us welfare queens. She said that we were robbing people and said that we were parasites for basically accepting these donations. And to be clear, uh, you know, I, I have not read the article. Ian read part of the article on Free Talk Live, so I did hear it. And she does, like, say, like, I'm not saying everybody who accepts donations is yada, yada, yada. Just people who she disagrees with is is basically the premise of the article, and she's a, a you know she'll deny it to her dying day, and a lot of people who like sort of white knight for her will will say otherwise. But you know she's sort of a sort of a social justice warrior. She uh, I've clashed with her before. It was on the uh, with, you know over fighting with Antonio Bueller when Antonio <laughs> Bueller was doing all his race pimp bullshit on Facebook, yeah. and I was like fuck you social racist, justice warrior, racist hang yourself and stuff like that. Yep. Yeah, and she she chimed in with that, and I blocked her. You know, over a year ago, I blocked her on Facebook, and now she's involved with like Freedom Fiends, which is a really lame wannabe Free Talk Live show. That you know, they have some FCC stations, but they're not. It's not a terribly interesting program. The guy who operates it is not a terribly talented or smart guy, and he um you know is just he's jealous basically and so they realized over the course of time that like I attack people and that draws traffic to their website because if I link to you and other people are viewing my blog then all of a sudden people click on your website which without the other things happening nobody does right nobody cares about your hey, website Josh make a note uh, we gotta start attacking Chris Campbell right right I mean people <laughs> do this people will do this and look it's a common tactic I mean I have done it before too right to, to sort of like pick a fight with somebody in order to generate controversy to generate traffic I mean it's it's normal and I don't generally begrudge people for doing it but I don't like um, you know people <coughs> people like uh, uh, what's her name MK Lords uh, just making these really philosophically and, and factually dishonest statements that you know oh in my spare time I just walk around uh, you know uh, threatening meter maids and and uh, telling everybody to kill cops because I'm too much of a coward to do it myself just really intellectually lazy uh, failure to even try to understand what it is that you're saying really sophist uh, stupid things and and I, I I have no respect for that and so I don't uh, when I did I did write a response to the article but for that reason I wouldn't link to her I wouldn't even do her the concept of naming her by name because she's not uh, she's not a particularly talented or, or useful person yeah I think your article was called uh, can't tell the difference between welfare and donations and I, I agree with you I, um, I, I I mean I think Josh and I are ultimately going for donations here, you know. Well, I mean, the but choices anyways, that we have as content producers is basically, you know, to either solicit donations or get advertising or get, like, corporate sponsorship, right? And, I mean, corporate sponsorship is basically, you know, advertising slash donations in one, that you basically get some wealthy benefactor to pay for your show. And, well, you know, that's okay if you can do that, but I find that extraordinarily difficult to do with anti-state programs, right? Anti-state libertarian content is not something that wealthy benefactors tend to put their money into. People like the Koch brothers will put lots of money into, uh, you know, Americans for Prosperity and different political action committees because it stands to gain them political influence. If they can't gain political influence from it, then people who donate money to those sorts of things are terribly unlikely to fund it. So it's either advertising or it's donations. Advertising does not generally pay that well. Uh, unless you have really good sales talent, it doesn't pay that well. The best way, the way I make most of the money that I make for my website, Site, comes in through donations and if you want good content if you want it produced on a regular basis if you want talented people doing it on a regular basis these people have to be paid and they have to be paid you know a, a livable income that they can live off of and if they can't do that then they won't do it and donations are the way to do that but she doesn't have a problem with donations she said when she called into free talk live and Ian Freeman asked her he said you know look you have a donation link on your website if people start donating to you money in in such sums that you're able to quit your job and not go to work anymore would you be a blogger for a living and she said absolutely so you know it's not it has nothing to do with uh, you know basically it's just she doesn't like us she doesn't like our politics 
And so she doesn't think that you should give money to us. She just thinks that you should give money to lefty social justice warrior nanny state losers instead. I mean, that sounds like the typical nationalist narrative to me. Yeah, unfortunately. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's been good for you, I, I'm sure. As as was Colbert, uh, the Colbert Report, right? Same kind yeah, of deal. Yeah, exactly. I mean, so these things, they drive traffic to the website, and especially the thing about the donations thing, because people are like, oh, this lefty bitch is telling me not to donate money to him. Well, I'm going to go and do exactly that. And, of course, you know, that... It it up to my uh, it up up my donations uh, considerably for that particular day, and I was very happy about it. Uh, I'm not happy about having driven all of this attention to her. I wish that you know her article had collected dust and nobody ever saw it because I don't think it's a particularly interesting read. I, I think that it spreads a lot of uh, intellectual dishonesty and and sophist arguments, but. Um, you know, it definitely it it gave me a bump in my traffic. It gave me a bump in my email subscribers and Facebook likes and donations and everything else. So it worked out well for me, certainly. Well, I I, I hope one day to have a hit piece written against me. I I mean, that's all I can say. You'll get so, to it. <laughs> so Cantwell, man, we want you to plug yourself as hard as you can. ChristopherCantwell.com, folks. Anarchist, atheist, asshole. I uh, produce. New content damn near every single day, so I would encourage you to not only go to the website, but uh, sign up for the email address, at Chris, uh, email list at ChristopherCantwell.com slash subscribe, because I have this bad tendency of like getting banned from Facebook and stuff, because people are pussies who can't deal with uh, some, some frank talk, so I would like to communicate with you directly, so go to the website and check that out, and there you'll find the YouTube channel, you'll find the Facebook page, the Twitter feed, and everything else that you want to do, but most importantly, you're going to find no holes barred, non-aggressionist, hardline non-aggressionist, fuck your feelings type of content, which is the content that I produce because it's the content that I wanted to read but never did see before I started doing it. And and one more time, just for our audience's sake, what was the announcement that you made on our show for the first time? Uh, Some Garbage Podcast, the first episode of 2015, will be airing on January 2nd. Stay tuned to ChristopherCantwell.com for the exact show time. We look forward to that, Chris. Thanks for thanks for joining us, Josh. You have anything to end with? No, that's beautiful. <laughs> Thank you very um, much, yeah. gentlemen. I certainly appreciate it, Christopher. Thanks for coming on. Yeah, Anytime, thanks, man. Um, yeah. So, uh, okay, he's gone. And uh, <laughs> what we're gonna do is uh, on the next show we're gonna have the round table. We're gonna have. Um, is Chris coming on to that show? We don't know yet. We're gonna find. We're gonna find out the day after. We're gonna find out on on the second. Right. So uh, we will definitely have Rich Paul. Yep. We will. Uh, who else do we have? Luis Fernando Mises. Yes, that Liberty is. Liberty Doll. Definite, yeah. Marcel Edward Fontaine. Oh, good. Yeah. I. Th- I guess. Um, well, I guess I guess he is now. Hey, Marcel, you're on. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Je- is Jeff coming on as well? Jeff. Oh, Jeffrey yeah. Phillips. Yes, yes, yeah. he is too. Yep, yep, yep. Okay. Well, he said he said he said he'll give it a shot. You know, he's gonna have to drive out to the volcano, so we'll see. <laughs> <laughs> right. So um, that show will be January fifth at nine o'clock Eastern. Uh, this show right here will be edited down and posted uh, December 31st, so uh, New Year's Eve, um, Wednesday at 3 p.m. So uh, thank you all for watching, and uh, yeah, uh, take care. <laughs> <laughs>